This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Marco Regalado, the Executive Director of Player Personnel and Recruiting at Rice. Coach Regalado discusses his career path from GA to collegiate recruiting and his meteoric rise on social media. If you like this podcast, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new episodes each week. Now, let's get inside the headset with Coach Regalado. Coach, what's going on, man? How are you? Man, I'm great. Bless. Absolutely no complaints on my end. Well, just wrapped up spring ball. I know that's, uh, you know, always always fun part of the year. And, uh, you know, the coach is about to get back on the road and uh, ever-changing times in, in, in NCAA recruiting. So I know it makes for some interesting times as a as a director, player, personnel, and, you know, leader, recruiting, innovation, oh, yeah. NFL liaison, all, this, all the roles you – now all the hats you wear over there, huh? Yeah, man, it's crazy staying on top of the rules and all that stuff like that. But, yeah, we just finished up spring ball. I felt – we felt really good about how our guys competed and where we are as a team right now. The guys are on the road. And I tell you what, this job has really done for me the last two, three years that I've been in college recruiting. Uh, it's made me better at geography, way better than it was <laughs> in high school. Because I, like, sending coaches on the road, like, you, you got to start learning. Like, I thought I knew Texas. No, I'm still learning parts of Texas I never heard of. And then – Learned in other states that I had never visited till I went to Washington State. So, right. man, it's it's maybe pretty good geography. I can't say that. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? I, I used to joke with my wife. Uh, you know, I was recruiting Texas back in the day, and I, I was I said some along the same lines, but it was more about how you the pronunciation of these words. I come to the house and be like, I show her uh, Ariane if you're familiar with that I R R I R A A N, and be like, Hey, how would you say this? And Bastrop and you know. Uh, Groon and all these all these uh, <laughs> places around here that you get chewed out if you don't say it correctly, but uh man let's let's kind of dive in this thing. About a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, uh, you were gearing up to be a physical therapist. <laughs> you know that that's kind of where your career yeah. path was headed. Uh, I don't know if many people know that, uh, but but transitioned a little bit from your thought process of physical therapy to to strength and conditioning to ultimately you know clearly what seems to be a calling for you just just how much you've thrived in this industry what was you know what was some of that decision making like and, and you know what what brought you to the football uh world so you know I always wanted to be part of the football world I played it in high school I loved it I loved my coaches I loved everything about the sport and uh, I joke around my mom but she was also she was an educator and she forebode me from like, she's like, you're not going to be a teacher. You're going to go do something else. You don't want to do this. I've been doing this for 30 plus years. So we came to the, the, the conclusion of, you know, I'll be a physical therapist. You know, it's in the medical field. Um, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to be working with athletes the whole time. But it's interesting. I like the way the body works. So I went to Texas State to go be a physical therapist. Um, fast forward about three, four years, I'm in my senior year and I finish up my 300 hour internship and I go home. I'm like, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't do this. Right. Like, it's just not fast paced enough for me. It, it's, uh, the biggest thing was like, you know, athletes want to get back to the field. And then I realize you're not always working with athletes. So the, the, the focus I had at the time was geriatrics. And if you walk into a room and they're all like, you're like, hey, you ready for your therapy? And they're like, get out. Well, then you just turn around and leave. You can't force them. Like, they don't want therapy. So it's like you didn't have a bunch of people who wanted to get better. So a after that, went home, talked to my mom. I still wanted to be in athletics. So, again, the happy medium we found, she's like, well, why don't you go try athletic training? So they set me up. You know, my high school athletic trainer talked to him. I got a GA athletic training gig at Texas A&M Kingsville. That's what first got me there. And I did it and I have a huge, huge respect for athletic trainers. And I now understand why they're always in a bad mood because that's, it's a lot of work. Uh, but the whole time I was doing athletic training, I'd find ways to go sneak into the, the coaching meetings or I became really good friends with the, the defensive GA at the time who connected me with the defensive coordinator, Dave Brown. And the guy, like, so the GA was Kevin May. Uh, so I, I always just go hang out and talk football because that's what I love. And I love football. And I love being in the practices and just learning things. And 
after a year of doing athletic training, they had some shifting in the staff. That guy, Kevin May, got promoted to being a full-time, the full-time linebackers coach. So there was a GA vacancy. So he, he went to go tell Dave Brown, like, we don't need to go look anywhere. Like, we got our guy. He's right here in the building. He's just doing something. He's doing what he shouldn't be doing. He should be doing coaching. Yeah. So they pulled me in and asked if I wanted to. And I, it didn't even take me a day to think about it. I'm just like, yeah, you know. It, it, it's all led me to this. I was like, I, I need a coach. This is what I want to do. <laughs> so after that first year, I switched over to the coaching side of things. I worked with Ronnie Palmer on the defensive line and never looked back. Oh, man, that's awesome. I, th- this is probably my favorite part of every podcast, just asking guys how, how, how it started. And uh, it's always just a, just a little bit different for everybody. And clearly this is probably one of the more unique ones. Um, now, you mentioned twice in this you know, and telling that story so far that you kind of go back and talk to mom about career <laughs> paths and all that kind of stuff. So, what was that conversation like with mom when it was like, "Hey, I'm 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 not athletic training anymore. I'm I'm actually going to be on the field coaching, uh, working with the D line." Her her biggest concern was being, I guess, complacent. Uh, she'd seen it, and no, not not every coach, but you know, some coaches they just you know they get that one job. And they're happy sitting there for 30 plus years and they're good with it. Right. And I, what I try to tell her is like the, the same effort I would have put into being a physical therapist, being a doctor, being whatever I wanted to be. That's what I was going to put into coaching. I wasn't going to just be just a guy like, and that kind of put her at ease a little bit. She's always still worried. Um, just, she just, she was just wanting to make sure I was making the right decision. But then when she saw how happy it made me, um, Nah, she's my biggest supporter. It's my biggest cheerleader. Uh, yeah. So she loves what I do. Uh, she just, again, it's just like any mom. She worries. She wants the best for me and all that stuff. That's awesome, man. Well, uh, clearly you go uh, do your time there, and then you end up uh, getting into the teaching field, which which I know your mom was telling you to avoid. Uh, but you end up in the teaching field as, as a Texas high school football coach. Um, what was what was that transition? What you know, why did you choose not to maybe stay at the collegiate game? Was or did you want to coach high school football? You know, what what led you back to high school football in Texas? You know, I, I always wanted to do high school. Um, I love, you know, I feel like the ages of like fifteen through eighteen is when you have the biggest impact mm-hmm. on a kid's life. No question. At least that's what happened with me. And the local high school, Santa Gertrudis Academy High School really unique situation. They didn't have their own facilities or like public school, but privately owned by the King ranch. Uh, so their high school coach was Arturo Lozano. And I knew him since I was in high school because Bruni would come to, a, he used to be the head coach at Bruni and they'd come to some of our powerlifting meets. And so I'd see him in passing all the time because they would use our facilities. They'd use our stadium, they'd, you know, and he'd always just kind of like, in jest or in passing, he's like, when are you going to let me hire you? Uh, so when I graduated, it, the, just the timing was perfect. He had a PE job open up. And I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to dive in. Let's do this. So I joined his staff and man, I learned so much. Hey, not, not even football. Uh, from, from Coach Lozano, I, I learned how to be a leader. Uh, he, he, to me, is one of the best athletic directors in the state. And the fact that I got to spend uh, a year with him and learn how he operated it, I think it made me that much better. Uh, but he was kind of ultimately the one that convinced me, you know, I had an opportunity to stay at Kingsville uh, as a restricted earnings guy. You know, just I, I had wanted to do high school football and it was, I didn't have to move anywhere. There was a job already there locally. So I, I dove in and I, I fell in love with it. I loved it. Well, let me ask you this question. Obviously, with wanting to be a physical therapist at first and then strength conditioning path, uh, you, you clearly took enough hours to probably get some emergency certification uh, to, to be a teacher. Were you cert- Talk about the certification process just real quick because I know a lot of coaches actually, maybe, maybe not necessarily your same story, but they end up working a uh, nine-to-five job and – I've had tons of calls like, man, I want to get into coaching. I just don't know where to start. I don't have my cert. You know, I don't have experience. What what, what did you do to handle that certification requirement? So I didn't have any education background. I think 
when I started getting my master's, I got it in educational administration. Uh, but what I did is I went through, it's called something different now, but it was texasteachers.org at the time. Yeah. And it was an alternative certification program. So that spring, uh, leading up to what they were going to hire me that summer, it kind of gave me that time frame. They're like, Hey, you have this spring to get in that program, knock out the modules. And then, uh, you know, start taking some certification tests. And then once you get hired, you have a year to finish your, your professional PPR uh, certification. So that was the process I took. Uh, I felt like it was fast, quick, and efficient. Like I said, the modules, it's all, it's all about you. I was able to knock those out in, I felt like, two weeks. Once you finish the modules and you're eligible to ta- challenge a content exam, that challenged the PE test, I passed it. Then I was eligible for hire. Signed my contract a week later. There you go. I got you. I, well, I appreciate you sharing that, especially. Uh, yeah, I'm sure not just in Texas, but obviously, I we both live here, and uh, there, there was kind of some issues <laughs> this past year with having enough coaches on many staffs across the state, and that emergency certification uh, opportunity was, was was popping up here and there uh, at a lot of places. So I just want to at least give some people some knowledge on on, on what that looks like. Um, so uh, you know, you you take the job. Uh, you know, it's it's everything that you want more. Uh, and over the next five or so years, you 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 coach everywhere from the the valley all the way up to D- Dallas Fort Worth. You know, what was that experience like? I guess just uh, seeing different programs, number one, and then uh, you know all the experience you're able to kind of garner, especially as you transition into some of these collegiate recruiting roles. But uh, what you know, just in general, what was your experience like? Yeah, it, it was great. You know, I started off a 3A school with maybe 300 kids. Like I said, we borrowed facilities. We had to bus to different places, part of different campuses. My my second year that I was there, I taught actually on the King Ranch. I taught uh, uh, elementary PE and then elementary campus on the King Ranch. I got to go through gate guards and like get checked every morning before I went in there. Like, So it was such a unique experience. You know, from there going to another small school that had a little bit more resources in Mathis High School with a really, really rich tradition of football. Uh, and then, you know, Dave Brown, the guy who gave me my first job at Texas A&M Kingsville, got out of college coaching, and he ended up getting the head coaching job at PSJ Memorial. They gave me a call, and, of course, that's my guy, so packed up, moved down to the Valley to go work for him, now at a 5A school uh, down the River Valley, and, again, school with a lot of resources, a kind of a newer school in that school district, and enjoyed that experience. And then had an opportunity to go work at one of the biggest schools in the state in terms of like a 6A school in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And it had about 3,000 students at Eden High School. So I've been at the schools that you drive buses and you don't have the resources and right. you're, you're, make sh- you're making, you know, with, with what you got, makeshift, the 300 kids. And I've been at the schools where Eden High School has – 200 yard turf practice fields, an indoor 70 yard, you know, a, a district stadium, a stadium for the JV, a state of the art weight room. And it's been pretty cool to, to do all of that. And at the end of the day, you'd think there'd be a difference in the kids, but kids are kids. That's right. Uh, that's been the most refreshing thing about it. Well, um, Whenever I talk to head coaches, I'm always talking about, you know, transition and, you know, it's never a good time to lose a good coach. And, you know, now you got to go hop and hiring process. What does that look like? On the flip side, as you're, you know, uh, taking in your eyes uh, better jobs uh, or, or, or just b- different opportunities, you know, we call it, call it however you want to. What is that conversation like, you know, as you had to have this conversation maybe three or four times at the high school level? where you go and take a different opportunity, you got to go sit down and tell a head coach or, you know, somebody somebody like, uh, you know, Texas A&M, Texas A&M Kingsville head coach ends up giving you that opportunity. Uh, you know, what is that dialogue like when you when you got to go in the office and tell them you're taking a different opportunity? I, I don't think I've ever had a tough conversation. Obviously, nobody really wanted to see me go. But, right. again, it's like every, every time I took an opportunity, it was something that on paper – financially and all that stuff made sense. Right. It, it was the next step up. When I went from Santa Gertrudis to Mathis, I, it was, it was a coordinator title. It was the head strength for the district. Like, you know, it was, it was three, a, but to me it was like, 
there's an opportunity to have some some responsibilities and leaderships that I didn't necessarily have at Senator Cruz. You know, going from Mathis High School to PSJ Memorial, again, it was going from a 3A to a 5A, also having some coordinator time, but you're talking about a $25,000 raise. Yeah. So it made sense to me. No doubt. And then uh, going from PSJ Memorial to Eden High School, uh, there wasn't a pay raise, but it was an opportunity to work at a brand new up and coming program that I believed in. And it's something I had always wanted to do. I spent my whole life in South Texas. The furthest I had gone was Texas State. You know, everything else had been predominantly South Texas. And you hear these great stories and you see on TV the DFW football and 6A football. And I wanted to be a part of that. And uh, of course, they, like Dave Brown, my mentor, he told me I'd be ridiculous if I didn't take that job. So again, it's that I think to me that's that's a good way to figure out if you're working for a great person. Mm, yes, that sir. if you know there's a great opportunity for you that's better, and they tell you to go, that means they really truly care about your well being. That's right. Uh, obviously, again, they don't want to see you go, but they want to see you successful, and that's that's what's important to them. And, you know, every step has been important in terms of shaping me who I am and how, how you know getting me here today. Like I, so I, I've learned every a little. I've learned a lot of things everywhere I've been. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, uh, kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Uh, uh, Eaton High School was getting built when I was recruiting Dallas Fort Worth area, so I, I never got to step foot. But for some reason, I know exactly what it looks like on the inside because my man here <laughs> <laughs> downloaded this app called TikTok, and uh, you know, just 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 kind of started off posting posting funny videos that a lot of coaches can relate to and uh, end up going viral in almost everything you were posting there. Um, you know, I, I, I've always appreciated every opportunity I've had to meet you because, you know, those videos were hilarious and going meet you just very, very serious, very professional in everything that you do. Uh, what, what was kind of the – you know what were you, what was the expectation? You know when you downloaded the app, made made those videos. What were you expecting to happen? Man, I, I couldn't even tell you. I, I did it. Uh, I was bored, and I, I did it because I just wanted to make my staff laugh. That was really who it was for. Because I was kind of poking fun at a couple of people we had on staff at PSG Memorial, or a couple of coaches that I had crossed paths with at Senator Trudis. Because then I'd send it to like Coach Lozano and be like, well, "Guess who?" Yeah. Like. So it, it, it wasn't anything I, – I didn't sit down and be like, oh, yeah, yeah. this is going to change the course of my life. No, <laughs> no, it was like – I was like, I'm going I'm to make some funny videos. And because that's also kind of who I, I am. I, I am kind of a character at times. And I did theater in high school. It's just a part of who I am. And, uh, you know, the couple of the right people retweeted it, matched up. Probably, you probably retweeted a couple. And it just – I guess got in front of the right eyes and it's something the coaching community needed at the time. And it just took off like wildfire. Uh, I got something I absolutely did not expect. Uh, so that was, that was pretty wild. Yeah. So I guess at what point did, uh, <laughs> did you kind of look at me like, man, Hey, I made it at least for, you know, in, in this, in this realm of, uh, of the world, like, you know, your followers increased or whatever. At what, what point was that? You know, how long were you doing the videos before everything kind of blew up for you? So for me, it was, a uh, when I started getting like power five division one FBS head coaches sending me direct messages, like telling me your stuff's funny. I'm like, wait, you're watching my stuff. <laughs> like, uh, I, I think it was like the, the big eye opener one for me was like university of Texas was having their high school coaches clinic on zoom. Cause I mean, we're on a pandemic and I get on and it's like, I'm waiting till the end to ask a question. And like, there's, you know, I guess very few people at the time, I finally get my hand raised and they call on me and it's Bob Shipley. And he's like, no way. You're the guy. I'm like, wait, you know who I am? He's like, yeah, through the whole staff. We just share your videos. It's awesome. And then the other one was like, and it eventually leaded to me getting Washington state was I had a random DM from uh, uh, Nick Rolovich. I'm like, wait a minute. And from there became a friendship and we talked for the next two years. Uh, so that was, like I guess that that's kind of like when all these people that I had idolized and watched on TV and stuff like that started reaching out and telling me how much they appreciated what I was doing. I was like, okay, I, I, it's pretty serious now. <laughs> well, that, that's awesome, man. And you kind of made a great segue there because I was going to talk about that, you know, that transition from from uh, 
you know, Eaton to Washington State, and clearly you either have to go and let it be known that you that you that you want to uh, pursue an opportunity, or sometimes they pursue you. And it sounds like that y'all have built this connection via some of these viral videos that you put out. So, what the next two years look like in regards to you? You know, the next those two two years where you were having a, that dialogue with Coach Rolovich, what did that look like in regards to you finally getting a Washington State job? We never talked about a job. It was always, how are you doing? How's the family? We talked about video ideas. Um, I'd ask how, you know, I, I started, I became a Washington State fan. I started watching their games and they'd win. I'd text them, great job. They'd lose. i say, hey, next time. And same thing, like you'd be checking out how, how I was doing. And, you know, it, it, not, again, nothing about jobs, just back and forth dialogue. Like I said, we were really, truly building a friendship. And, uh, you know, I still had that itch. It was something I always wanted to do. And I'm at Eden High School and I see a job on the scoop. And another connection I made through the pandemic was, so I told you like at Texas A&M Kingsville, I was the D-line assistant GA under Ronnie Palmer. Mm -hmm. So Ronnie Palmer started having Zoom calls every Thursday, Thursday night, just random. He's like, I'm going to just invite a bunch of people and let's start networking. So from there, I met Ricky Longo. Ricky Longo was... Ronnie Palmer's D-line coach when he was a GA at Colorado State. So we made that connection. So fast forward a bit. Now I'm looking on the scoop of Washington State posted a recruiting assistant position. And we all know how the scoop works. Like it's, it's either probably already spoken for or maybe it's legit open. And Ricky Longo was in the staff of Washington State. So I had already connected with him that whole year prior during COVID. And he recruited the DFW area. So we were talking a lot about my recruits that I had at Eden. And uh, I called him and said, is this real? And what he did was he said, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go walk across the office. Don't hang up. So he has me on the phone the whole time he walks over there to the uh, chief of staff's office. He said, hey, Jason, this, this is a recruiting assistant job. Is it open? Or do we, or do we have people? He said, no, it's open. He says, all right, I got you. And he hangs up. So text me back later, make sure I applied. So I applied. Um, I didn't tell Rolo I applied. I'm just I'm just gonna apply. Uh, so then uh, the next day, like late, I think it was like 8 p.m., 9 p.m. or something like that. I get a DM from Rolo, and it's a picture of my resume. He's like, "Look what I found." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I got an interview. Uh, they still put me through that process. I had to interview with the director of play personnel, the chief of staff, director of all campus recruiting. I had to uh, tell them about who I was, tell them, you know, what I wanted to accomplish. And then at the end of it, they gave me a list of like five names. And you know, like, we need you to evaluate these prospects and get get these to us by the next day, like detailed, detailed evaluations and whether you'd consider them offers or not. So I did that the next day, submitted it. And then like, I didn't hear back from them for a week. So I was like, you know what? probably a really nice gesture of them courtesy interview i appreciate them giving me the time what an experience i got to be on a zoom call with power five staff and all that stuff and then like i said a week later like at 10 o'clock at night um i got a, a, a message from rollo and i just said see you in a week oh i'm like the did i get the job like what <laughs> it's like the first i've heard from him in a week and then he says yeah my chief of staff jason is going to call you in about 15 minutes so that was, that was that, that process. And again, that was another hard conversation I had to have with, had to have with coach Miller at Eden high school. Cause literally like two weeks prior, I had just told him, I said, yeah, I love Eden high school. I don't think I'll leave for another high school job. And again, it just had everything you needed in that. Uh, but when I called and told him, uh, like, you know, Hey, I hate doing this. It's Washington state called. And he's like, don't, you go. It's power five. It's, right. it's a great opportunity. You're young, you're single. He's like, go, do it. So again, that was another one. Like, he wanted me to go do great things, and I always I appreciate him for doing that too. And same thing with my administration. I had at Eden because I felt like I was an integral part of the special ed department there too. And they didn't want to see me go, but they understood that these offer all these opportunities don't come every day. That's so, right. Uh, I'm super appreciative for everybody there, you know, being super supportive and me going. And now real quick, I, I have a few questions about th that interview process and the evaluation process of the prospects and all that kind of stuff. Like 
well, where did your preparation come from? I I know you spent a little time at the, you know doing the defensive line stuff uh, as a graduate assistant, so I'm sure you, you ran across some film over your time there at Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, but to sit down in that facet, you know, a different program that you're, you're trying to see if the kid's good enough for. What well, you know, were there nerves there, and uh, how did you feel prepared to answer a lot of the questions that you got in that interview, knowing you didn't have necessarily that experience? Yeah, I was nervous. Um, I will have to give a lot of credit to Dan Hatman and the Scouting Academy because I had literally that that was my COVID project. You know, when everything was kind of slowed down and we were able to do you know, do things and you had time for this. I, I did that. I did the scouting academy for six to eight weeks. And it's essentially kind of trains you to be an NFL type scout and you learn to evaluate and you learn to watch film a different way. So I think that prepared me uh, to make those evaluations. And like I said, especially time at Kingsville to recruiting. So I felt comfortable with these evaluations. Uh, uh, I, the actual interview process was pretty, I, 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 I said I was nervous, but it wasn't very stressful. Uh, there were very, like I said, they're great people on there. So they were just having conversations and asking a little bit, getting to know me a little bit yeah. and asking if I knew anything about Pullman, which to be honest, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, Cause I always have a funny story. Like when I, when I heard Washington state, I'm thinking Washington, I'm like, man, I'm going, I'm going to the big city. It's going to be great. You know, Seattle, crazy anatomy, oh, man. seafood. And then I, and then I, I drive and I finally start looking up Pullman. I'm like, Oh, it's just wheat fields. Yeah. All right. All right. I was, I was, I was still pumped up about the opportunity. I just, my, my, my mind, I think Washington, I think Seattle. That's right. Now, when somebody asks me about Washington, it's, go Cougs all day. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right, man. Well, that, that, that's, that's awesome, man. That's a, that's a tremendous story. Uh, real fast about the the Scout Academy. What more than anything, just what drove you to to do that? You know, to have that experience. Did you foresee maybe at some point in time doing an NFL scout thing or being a collegiate, you know, uh, recruiter? You know, what 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 made you decide during the pandemic when this opportunity isn't even nowhere near you at that point in time? Uh, what made you decide to do that? Because since I was the coach at that 3A school with 300 kids, I had, I had college and NFL aspirations. And I was like, what, what can I do extra to, to set myself apart, to prepare myself for these kind of opportunities? I saw uh, and Jake Longy, who is a huge, I consider him a mentor and a great friend of mine. He had done it. So I asked him about it. He said, it's a great experience. It's going to prepare you. It's going to make you better. So I trusted him and I reached out to Dan Hadman, signed up and, uh, it, it was a great experience, but it was just, again, like nobody prompted me to do it. You know, I, I had asked my boss, Dave Brown at the time, cause he spent 22 years as a college coach before he got into the high school world. And I said, do you think this is something that's going to help me? So it's not going to hurt you. Um, and you have the coaching side of things. Now it's just going to show people that you know how to evaluate too. Uh, cause that's what a lot of people forget too. Like, I, I guess I've been doing the recruiting thing for three years, but people forget like I was a football coach for, uh, six, five, six years yeah. before I got into the whole recruiting thing. Right. Yeah. I, d I did not forget. I, I tell you that. And you just beat me yeah. to you beat Sam, Sam up before I asked the question, but it's a good time to ask it now. Uh, a lot of these roles um, sometimes get filled with, you know, tremendous recruiters that are 100% passionate about recruiting and that's all they want to do. Sometimes they get filled with guys that, you love to have on your staff, and you know at some point in time, if a D line job's open, then we we'll, we'll, we'll might knock on your door and see if you're interested in coming over. Um, you know, a bunch of different guys can fill some of these off the field roles at these different universities. You know, where do, do you have the itch to still coach the ball? Uh, you've you've done a phenomenal job with the recruiting aspect, um, as expected. But you know, would you love to coach the actual ball again? Yeah, I think I said at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a ball coach. Right. That's that's what I am, but again, I, I know recruiting is is everything in college football. So I love the role that I'm in. I love being able to, to evaluate and help Coach Bloom build this roster and this team. And, and I love building relationships with recruits and their parents and their families and everything. And high school coaches, it's all part of it. But you know, I, I still find time to go sneak into meetings, just like I did when I was that athletic training uh, GA. Um, I'm out at practice every day. So, uh, yeah, you know, you miss the grass. 
And that's at the end of the day, that's, I think what my long-term goal is, is to get back into it. Uh, whether it be, you know, college or, you know, NFL, like I said, I, I, I'm still that small town kid with big dreams and they haven't led me astray. So I guess I'll, I'll keep pursuing the highest ceilings. So somebody tells me to stop. <laughs> I love it. Man. I'll probably still keep going. Um, so after Washington State um, transitioned to Rice, uh, we recently been named executive director, of player personnel, recruiting innovation, um, and the NFL liaison. You know, how has that been transitioning to more of the a leadership role rather than? Yeah, you know, I know you were an assistant there at, at Washington State, getting your feet wet, and you know, I, I know you were heavily involved with everything, but now you're you're kind of you know a director. You're kind of running your portion of the show. How have you? Uh, have you transitioned into that? It's been great. And I feel the the two years that I spent at Washington State prepared me because I had like three different roles. I started off as a recruiting assistant. Did that for six months where you have your hands in everything. You're basically a glorified intern. You're doing cut-ups. You're helping out with visits. You you do it all. Um, you know, our director of on-campus recruiting, Jesse Siomalo, she had an opportunity to go work for the 49ers. She took that, and Rolo asked me if I wanted to bump into that role. He said, it's going to be a little bit less football than you're used to, and a little bit less film. You're still going to be involved in that process, but you're going to be doing a lot more of game planning these visits and stuff like that. And I've always been one that's been told, don't ever turn down a promotion. Yeah. So, uh, And I wasn't scared of any challenges. And the funny thing is, like, before this job, I had maybe booked one flight for myself in my entire life. And now I get this on-campus job, and I'm having to book flights for everybody <laughs> and hotels and rental cars. So yeah. I learned a ton on the fly. Uh, you know, I was trained up by Jason Severco and Joshua Murrah, and so those are two, two of the best in the industry, in my opinion. And they, they really molded me into who I am today. And, you know, I did that for another six months. We had some staff transition, Joshua Murrah, you know, leaving to Arizona, uh, Jason at the time leaving to Boise. So well, during that change, I kind of tried to be that glue that kept everything together at the time. And we brought a new direct, new director of player personnel and you know, coach Dicker was named the head coach. And I get, they appreciated me trying to be that glue. So the reward to me was they promoted me to director of recruiting. And I hadn't even been in college football for a whole calendar year. So I was, Really excited, really appreciative about that, and again, ready for the challenge. And that six months in that role, I worked directly with the director of player person. I was in his office every day, picking his brain, Rob Schlager. And again, he's just another, he, he's, he's a genius and how he evaluates things. And everybody's so different in how they do things. So I take things from Jason, I take things from Josh, I take things from Rob, and I'm learning. And I think especially without that last six months, I don't think I'm ready for this job that I have now. So like all those things that all those steps that I was able to take, uh, along with all my previous experience as a high school coach, dealing with college coaches really prepared me for the role that I'm in. And now am I perfect? No, I still have some hiccups and I'm still learning as I go. And I'm still calling people for advice and figuring things out. But, uh, no, what was I ready for this role? Absolutely. And, I, I love this leadership role I have. I love the team that I have, uh, my recruiting team. Uh, and like I said, working with Coach Bloom, like I said, he's one of the best out there in terms of just being a great boss, being a great football mind. And he like he loves and appreciates recruiting and puts a lot of uh, time and effort into it. And like, I feel like there are some head coaches that don't do that. So, again, it's, it's been a great experience. Well, one, one of the key – Parts of your role there in uh, this is probably going to have a, a ton of different meaning is the recruiting innovation. Um, just real quick, if you had to say it in a couple sentences, what, 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 what does that mean? It just means this is a constant changing game. Like you just like you said, the rules change every day. Yeah. So we got to innovate. We got to find different ways to adapt to these rules. We got to find different ways to be different, adapt in the recruiting world. Right. Uh, you know, it was funny because I saw it, on, saw it on a TikTok video. Uh, I think it was like five, six years ago or something like that. Somebody from Rice University sent a recruiting letter to a quarterback's cat and that quarterback committed. Mm. That's recruiting innovation. That's doing something different. So that's not necessarily, I, I haven't sent a, a letter to a pet yet, but like, 
that's the kind of things we're talking about, like doing things out of the box, doing things that are different uh, to forever change with this ever-changing game. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's interesting. I, I, I clearly figured that's what it meant. Um, but I wanted to hear from your own self. It's interesting because you, you, you get a receiver job, and I, I say that just because I'm a receiver guy. You get a receiver's job, and – you go and you, you you call your old coaches to get some drills, and then you go to the AFCA, and you know you sit in a couple of deals, and you find a couple of things you like, and then you, you get to know more people, you ask more questions, you go visit staffs, and you get better. But when you start talking about how quickly this NCAA lens, landscape is changing, and then you pair that with being innovative in recruiting, it's like there's really not a ton of people that you can go bounce ideas off of because everybody's just in their own lane trying to figure this thing out. Um, you know, how, how do you approach that when it's, you know, it's just, this is all new, you know, and you're, you're responsible for being innovative in it. So, you know, I guess anything you do at that point is innovative. Uh, but, but, you know, how, how, how have you handled just so much changing and trying to keep up with, especially being, being, being in charge of what goes on there? Well, the funny thing is like, all I know is change because for the last two, three years, yeah. That's the NCAA has been like, but like before that, it was pretty like, like the, there was no transfer portal. There was no right. uh, NIL. Like I got in right when everything was going 110 miles an hour. So it's all I know. Um, but no, bouncing ideas off of people. I, I feel like the personnel world is more open to things like that. Uh, like the coaching world, like some people are like closed off. Like yeah. They're not going to really share everything unless they really know you or when they do clinics, it's all about oh, yeah, we run inside zone well because we have culture. Like, no, you're not talking about what you're doing and stuff like that. But with the with the personnel world, at least like with the people that I have in my circle that I'm able to call or even people that I'm meeting for the first time, like we're all sharing. We're all – because we're all in the same boat. We're all swimming. We're trying to learn because things change. Like we can get a new rule change tomorrow. Like you, you just don't know. So, again, it's it's forever adapting. It's forever changing, and it's – I think we all kind of lean on each other. I lean heavily on my compliance people here at Rice, so I got to give them some love because when you get these innovative ideas, that's the first person you got to call right. compliance to see if you can even do it. That's right. Well, Coach, I enjoy spending some time with you, man. Uh, you know, definitely appreciate appreciate you here over at the AFCA. You know, spoke for us this past year. You know, at the drop of a dime, you're willing to hop on the podcast with us, man. So uh, definitely appreciate you and. Wishing you guys the best in uh, spring recruiting and uh, hope to see you over in Nashville in 23. Excuse me, 24. It's 24. Oh, we'll be there. All right. Well, Coach, I appreciate it, man. Before we leave, if you want to plug uh, any social media accounts that you want, you know, definitely yours and any 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 other accounts, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, make sure you guys are following Rice Football on Instagram, on Twitter. And, uh, you know, we have a great social media and creative team, and they're all constantly updating with videos and creative content as well as putting out like our camp dates and all that stuff like that and like i said you guys can follow me and it's uh it's pretty consistent on, on all social media platforms it's at coach regalado um all lowercase and I said, that's the best place to find me there you go coach we'll make sure to link that in the show notes and once again i appreciate you and best of luck this spring thanks coach thanks for listening to this week's episode of inside the headset if you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about, head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at we are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. 
is geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.